Hey, and welcome to another episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast, where play meets strategy. I published another episode of the podcast on the audio form, but this, I hadn't published a new one in a video yet, uh, or at least, I mean, after the hiatus I've had for a few months. And luckily, we have a really exciting guest. You can skip a couple of minutes ahead if you want to go straight to the conversation. I just thought I'd give a quick intro to introduce the, my guest, Andy Nairn. Andy Nairn that you can see on the photo right next to me or here. I'm not sure because I'm, I've changed the tab and I'm not looking at uh, my setup anymore. Uh, as you can see, I just, I'm testing stuff on branding. As you know, I mean, I'm a brand strategist, but I'm not a graphic designer. So, or at least I used to be a very long time ago. Anyway, let's take some us off topic. Uh, Andy is a, one of the most, if not the most awarded strategist in the world. And uh, I have his bio here from the publishing house. As you can see, he's publishing a new book, Go Luck Yourself. So he's been uh, promoting the book, which is ready for pre-order at the moment. And Andy stumbled into advertising after studying law at Edinburgh University, which we talk about a little bit in the podcast. And 30 years later, he's one of the most respected brand strategists. And it was really, really a treat to talk to him. Um, founder of one of the most of the UK's and worldwide most successful creative agencies, Lucky Generals has been shortlisted. Lucky Generals is in the name of the agency uh, that he co-founded and uh, is um, leads as well, of course, has been shortlisted for Campaign Magazine's Agency of the Year for the last five years in a row. And he's been named the country's top strategist for the last two in a row. He has uh, a whopping amount of strategy awards and effectiveness awards over 24 from the IPA, uh, the, in, the Institute for Practitioners of Advertising in the UK, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I might be mistaken on the number, exact number, because I don't have it right in front of me. It has, he has been listed as one of the top five creative people in the world in advertising by Business Insider. And he wants to share his luck and his life with others. So he's donating all of his royalties to Commercial Break, an organization that helps working class talent break into the creative industries. So of course, he's had a bunch of different interviews and it's great. Uh, that he was game to do something a little bit playful. So we run through an exercise that you'll see. So, of course, we split the conversation between uh, a little bit about his life and the kind of conversational uh, way that I usually do for the podcast, really. And as you know, if you've been following my podcast, I've been uh, experimenting and I'm still experimenting with including a lot more actual game and play elements within each one of the episodes. So we prepared something special for this particular episode with Andy, which I think is going to make it actually quite different from most of his other interviews. I mean, I have not watched all of the interviews he's doing to promote the book. Anyway, I'm going to start rambling. So I will uh, say with no further ado, I'll let you discover the kind of activity and fun that we get onto that are inspired both on one hand from role playing games and on another hand, from musicians and creativity that Andy introduces to us that comes a little bit from the book or the kinds of ideas that come from the book. Andy Nairn and Willem for the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. Enjoy. Hey, Andy, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate well, it. Thank you very much for to, taking the time uh, to talk to me. I'm really appreciative as well. It's uh, getting back into proper podcasting season. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. Fantastic. Cool. Uh, well, I usually like to start with a, and plus it's kind of a serendipity stuff that you've been talking about a little bit with a fun fact. As usual, I do a bit of research on the guests that are coming on and I, I try as much as possible to limit my research time so that, because uh, I found in the past that I, if I over-research, then I don't have as much fun in the conversation to discover new stuff, even mm -hmm. though I'm sometimes embarrassed by the fact that, you know, somebody like you was I'll have a bunch of awards and a really fulfilled career that I should know more about you. But then, um, anyway, did you know yeah. that there is a, a homonym, another Andy Nairn, who is uh, in Australia, Hobart, Tasmania, and won third place at the Barista Competition in 2012 in Tasmania. Uh, I only found this because I was looking you up on YouTube, and there's a video of him making very, very fancy coffee. That, that's yeah. amazing. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if that was the Andy Nairn you'd booked on today? You know, there was that lovely, I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago on the BBC, there was a lovely example where they had asked someone on to talk about Apple, whatever Apple was doing up to the moment in time. Mm -hmm. And I think somebody had come, it might have been a taxi driver or somebody like that, who was waiting um, um, behind uh, the scenes and, and was ushered onto stage and was you know, very, just very polite and, and didn't decline 
So he ended up being interviewed as the guest and he had a go at answering all these questions. And you could see the interviewer wondering, thinking that this guy doesn't really know what he's talking about. But, you know, he, he gave it a good old go for 10 minutes of uh, attempting those questions. So maybe I am the barista from Hobart. And uh, if only I'd prepared very fancy coffee questions, which I yeah. do know a coffee writer. That's a specialism that exists. Uh, and I also know a person that is a tea specialist, which came through, that's a story for another time, but I, I met somebody who started in graphic design and uh, started from designing her mom's yoga practice. And that led on to suggesting her to open a tea bar. And uh, she did tea branding for a very small tea bar in the middle of the States years ago. And one thing led to another, and now she's an international tea consultant. She's the person when a tea company wants to find out about whether the tea leaves in Taiwan or Southern China are better, they call that person and she knows. What an amazing uh, trajectory. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, and I like those kinds of serendipitous, very random uh, conversations and topics. And, and uh, this is gonna be a little bit of the, re the thread for our conversation as well, I think, because fr from what I understand, the new book that you published, Go Luck Yourself, has a little bit of that idea in mind. But before we talk a little bit more about the book, maybe just a brief introduction about who you are for anybody who doesn't know you who might be listening or watching this. Yeah, sure. So I am one of the founders of uh, an agency called Lucky Generals, which is, um, I guess, one of the top agencies in uh, the UK. But we also now have an office in New York that we've just opened. Um, and I guess we have made our name with um, some big uh, global campaigns for the likes of Amazon. So we've done, you know, their holidays campaigns for the last few years with the sort of singing boxes that, you know, many of you will know, um, or also three of their last four Super Bowl ads. So some, some big blockbuster, you know, global stuff. Um, but then we do a lot of, um, you know, domestic work in the UK as well for people like the Co-op and Yorkshire Tea. So it's a really nice mixture um, of work. We're, we're not a huge agency. There's about 80 of us, I think, in the UK and maybe 20 in New York. Uh, so we're still quite nice, you know, size. We still know each other's names, you know, and um, we're still only seven years old. So we still think of ourselves as a startup, even though we're, I guess, technically not really anymore. Yeah. Cool. And uh, I believe, so you're from Scotland, is that correct? That's right. So hope everyone's, uh, you know, dealing with the accent. <laughs> and where'd you grow up? I grew up in the middle of nowhere. So a very rural part of um, Scotland, um, just over the borders. It's, it's called the Borders. Um, it's literally 10 miles, you know, into Scotland. Um, uh, but, um, and it was lovely. It was a very ordinary place. Um, you know, a very, uh, ordinary upbringing, went to the local comprehensive school. Um, and, you know, it's, it's about as far from advertising and, you know, the bright lights of London as you can possibly imagine. And I actually think that has turned out to be a really good thing because obviously in our line of work, you need to be able to, um, you know, sort of uh, understand you know, just, you know, real people, ordinary people. Um, and I guess like in a lot of countries, there's a sort of a metropolitan bubble, if you're not careful. In, in the UK, yeah. it's really pronounced because London's so huge. Um, so it helps to have, you know, all my roots really and all my connections and my friends are outside of London. So, so that keeps me a bit real. So you keep a lot of connection to that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so you were talking just like normal kind of countryside. Was it a small village town where you grew up or? Yeah, it's well, it's um, it's funny it's how the, your perceptions of these things change. So I, I grew up in a, a place which is actually the county town of, uh, you know, the biggest town for miles around. But it, it was 2000 people. So it's, you know, it's pretty tiny. Yeah. Uh, at the time, I thought it was you know, big, but it, obviously it's it's minuscule now. Um, and it's then because I, I grew up in a village of the same size, which I knew was small because we could take the train and go into Paris, and that was a oh, lot bigger. Exciting. Still, yeah, considered, yeah. And there were fields and a forest, so I'm like, this is very small. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we did sort of, uh, you know, we did know that we were. I don't think they realized quite how sort of um, rural and sort of um, uh, you know out of the way it is. It's, it's it's the place in Scotland, if you can imagine this, where so it's. It's on the way to Edinburgh. So most tourists, you know, Edinburgh is a huge, you know, it's, it's not a big city, but it is a, a massive tourist destination. Uh, and then the Highlands in the north of Scotland, you know, lots of people, you know, go through where we are, you know, on the train, or they maybe drive through or they fly to Edinburgh and they just miss out this lovely little, it's very beautiful, you know, rural uh, countryside um, that just no one, no one really bothers about, which is probably what makes it 
sort of special, I guess. Yeah, um, which does track back to the idea that you were saying earlier about going out, being outside of the big metropolis that yeah. tends to have not really a good idea of what goes on in the uh, in the rest of the country, as like the states they're called the flyover states, you know. Yes, it's, yeah, do you know, it's, it's exactly that. And a much, obviously, it's a much smaller scale, but it is a, it's literally, I hadn't really thought about that. It's a flyover, you know, train over uh, state, I guess. Um, and so the people have got, you know, all the same sort of qualities that those sort of people have. They're real and it's uh, agricultural. So they are lit literally sort of down to earth uh, people. Um, you know, you, uh, I, I just do think that has always been a really helpful thing. And also in, our, in, in, in the UK, people can't really tell. You, you know, they know you've got a Scottish accent, but they don't know, it doesn't fit in with their sort of class system. So right. you could be, you could be very poor or you could own an enormous castle in Scotland for all they know. So they don't really know where to put you in that sort of uh, very odd system that the English kind of have when it comes That's to true, because it's worth bearing in mind for anybody who know who doesn't know this, who might listen from another country or the States or whatever, it is a strong thing for the English in particular then, to classify you socioeconomically based on your accent. Yeah, that, right? that's fair. It's, yeah, it's still a yeah. huge, a huge big deal. Um, and as, as I say, having a, have an accent that they don't, they know is different, um, it just doesn't fit into that sort of hierarchy. They, they, they just can't place it. So you can get away with being, you know, all things to all people, I think. Well, that right. certainly seems to was sort of helped me over the years. But that said, the Scottish probably, do they have a similar way to classify things, but with, within Scottish accents? Because I believe yeah. that Edinburgh is more considered more posh than a Glaswegian accent, I think. Yeah, that's, sure. that, that's right. I mean, again, there are sort of, obviously, you can have, there's, there's lots of different accents in Scotland. Sure. And um, yeah, Edinburgh typically is seen as being more posh. Although, you know, you can, you know Edinburgh is also the, the home of train spotting and, you know, urban Welsh and, you know, all these very gritty books. So there's, there's obviously a very strong working class population in Edinburgh too, but that's the um, you know the, the sort of stereotype. So I guess we all have our. Stereotypes. What kind of child were you? Because you know that I have an interest, and in, we'll talk about this a little bit later, and we'll play around with it and play and games, and of course this tends to be the realm of children and growing up. And what kind of stuff did you do to play, and what kind of child were you? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting. Child or teen, like just youth, I guess. In general. I loved, uh, I guess, all the usual teenage stuff. I loved sport. I was really into rugby. It's a, you know, it's a big rugby playing part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I loved football. Um, I loved music, you know, playing in bands. And, you know, that's always been a big part of my life, um, which I still keep up very badly. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, as I say, it was kind of unremarkable. There's nothing, you know, there was no uh no sort of uh, uh, extraordinary dramatic things that would sort of sure. um, but but i think that was the sort of the helpful aspect and uh, mr oh. Avery, that's it <laughs> mr okay cool well here's an interesting one because i i noticed that you um so you studied law i saw right and yeah. and then you found somehow advertising and marketing which you did study as well yeah. uh and and it seems, at least reading through your LinkedIn um, profile, of course, you have a lot of awards and you're known for this. And you've been asked, I think, probably many times because there's a few videos. So I'm sure a lot of peace people have asked you a lot of times, like, how do we do these? How do we get the same awards? But I, I was also interested in noticing that it seems you had recognition and awards as well as a student, or at least you got honors and a best in class student. So I was like, oh, you didn't start the awards with your advertising career. You had them before. So yeah, I was I'm wondering a, if that was like, I, I don't know, what did you attribute that to? Or like a studying method or discipline or anything? Uh, do you know, no, I sort of, I've enjoyed the things that I have, um, uh, that I've, uh, you know, uh, studied, I guess. Maybe that's the secret of it. Yeah, it's a classic thing. You, you do better at the things that you're interested in. I, I really loved law, for instance. I thought it was, you know, absolutely fascinating. Was Why very, choose law in the first place? Or was that no, particular... <laughs> It was almost because I couldn't think of anything. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. In Scotland, yeah. well, you, you go to university quite young. So, I mean, I went when I was 17. Yeah. And it's, it's quite young to sort of really make a choice of, and then you have a four-year degree. So it's it's uh, it's quite different, you know, system than in England. And actually the law is very different in in Scotland. It's much more like European, like French law. It's, it's a really very different system of law. And so... It just felt like an interesting, quite a general course uh, to do. If you don't know what to do, you know, people always kind of say, um, or they said to me back then, well, 
you can't go wrong with a law degree. It looks impressive and you can do business or get into all sorts of things. So I, I did it, but I quite soon I sort of realized I didn't really want to practice it, but I liked the problem solving aspect of it. And I liked the putting together of a story mm. and putting together a case, really. You know, you're, you're putting a client's best case study, you know, forward for them. So so you can sort of see how that might translate into advertising. And I had a conversation with a, a lecturer at the time uh, who's who subsequently turned out to be you know a massive multi-million selling um, author. Uh, so it's, it's quite an odd sort of thing. And he's gone on this direction. So it was a guy called Alexander McCall Smith, who's written, you know, I think he's probably sold about 50 million uh, copies of his um, uh, ladies detective agency books of um, okay. Botswana. So anyway, he, he was a very interesting, you can probably tell from that, quite an unusual guy himself. He's, he's teaching law, but I sort of said, I, I love certain aspects of it and he said well if you if you really like putting a story together um but you don't you don't want to the corporate world of the law why don't you think about something like advertising um and he was obviously thinking about the same stuff because he went off to be much more successful than i am uh, and, and write these books but but for me that stuck with me and i eventually picked it up and uh i, I did a, a year's postgraduate in glasgow uh to sort of find out a little bit more about it to see if i would like it and i did um, so again, I think, you know, in bo- both those courses, I really enjoyed. And, and I guess that helped me with uh, my swatty uh, school uh, scores. <laughs> and from the uh, going straight into like, so I guess after after that master's, you found a job in advertising, right? Sounds yeah, like that's yeah. What you're, you're aiming for that already at that point? Yeah, exactly. So I, I applied sort of halfway through the master's because that was only a one year thing. Um, I applied for jobs at all the big agencies, like everybody does, and that was all. You know, I did apply for you know lots of jobs in Scotland, but they were few and far between. So I, you know, like a lot of people, I get drawn to the big city, and um, and I just was I was pretty lucky. I got into one of the biggest agencies, which was Abbott Mead Vickers, and I, I applied as a an account manager actually because that was the sort of job that I'd heard of, and um, I'd never heard of strategy or planning. Um, but somebody, thank goodness, sort of spotted that I would, I would probably be a terrible account manager. And they sort of, I'm sure, terrified at the idea of me being an account manager, sort of steered me into this thing called planning. And I've, I've done it ever since. So I'm very grateful for them. You're not the first one to tell me a similar story. <laughs> I think if I remember correctly, Richard Huntington had told me something oh my similar. As in, anyway, there's a few of my, the guests that have been lucky to talk to, either for the podcast or just around a coffee or a beer and... Well, like you know i had a chance of being interviewed and they were like yeah i don't think you should be account manager you should go to or do no, R- R- richard was at amv at the same time as me we jo- he was joined a little bit before me so and i dread to think of the agency that had richard huntington and me as as the if we if we were both their account, as manager. account managers <laughs> <That's a> terrible <laughs> combination <laughs> It's so, funny. so would you consider that one of your lucky breaks or like when talking about luck is that um is that a good example yeah, definitely. You know, as I say, I, was, I grew up in a place that turned that was probably maybe felt a bit boring at the time, but is turned out to be a really good thing. Um, I've, I've sort of locked my way into do law, which turned out to be good on the way to doing something completely different. Uh, and then getting that first break into the industry, which, as we know, is so hard, yeah. um, you know, and stumbling into a job that I didn't even really know existed was was uh, was a nice lucky break. So um, I really believe in how powerful that sort of force can be in life and not obviously you've got to sort of capitalize on it to some degree um uh, but uh, i think you also have to appreciate the luck that you've had along the way that's what i've tried to do and, and not kid yourself that you that it's all been down to your amazing sort of special powers um but to appreciate that you've you've probably had a few breaks and yeah. some helping hands from other people along the way uh, and I, actually, one of the ideas that was interesting because I was reading, uh, you wrote about luck and probably in preparation, but not probably, it is uh, totally talking about the book, Go Luck Yourself, in Contagious. And I was just catching up on that. And I was wondering about, and we just mentioned this before we started recording, on, on how do you, pers- and I don't know if this is something you talk about in the book, and, uh, and you're welcome to give me a blurb about the book at, at the same time, uh, talking about this idea of because I think about luck and I automatically, when looking at the idea of the book and to read about it, I haven't read it yet because uh, it's, has it launched now or no, not yet? So if, um, uh, it's it's out in Ju- the beginning of June, so you can pre-order it now. So yeah, I would right. 
if you'd if you'd read it, I'd be really worried. I'd be thinking, how's it leaked? How's it got out there? <laughs> That's right. You did tell me it was June. I forgot. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but I immediately go to think about an intricate relationship with randomness. Yeah. And or chance, which I guess is a synonym, but it's it's but how do you see those two things it, like correlate? Do you see them as the same? One comes from the other or mm -hmm. I think they're related, don't they? The sort of pure luck, you might call it, which I guess is the random sort. Um, and maybe that's the sort of luck that you've got no um, control no control over, literally no control over. So yeah. I guess, um, which is probably a little bit less useful to us, really. Um, and then there's other sort of luck that you can you can influence. So my, my an analogy perhaps would be like cards. If, if When somebody deals you a fairly dealt pack of cards then the cards that you are given is I guess random and you you can't claim the credit for having a great hand of cards um, but then how you play those cards uh, you require some skill and you know you can take advantage of the situation and you know make make your luck to to some degree and I think that's the same with so much stuff in life you can lots of us get opportunities sometimes we don't get opportunities and um, you know I think so I don't believe that everybody has got the equal luck in life you know so, there is a school of thought in Western philosophy or business that says there's no such thing as luck. We all start off equal. We can all do anything. I think that's just not credible. You know, there's we some of us are born very fortunate in terms of our demographics or our families and all that sort of stuff. Um, but what you can then do is with the hand that you've been dealt, try and play the best game possible. And yep. um, that's what I that's really what the book is about. It's you know, because I think the same applies to organizations and brands, you know, some brands inherit more luck than others you know they might have been going for many years and have built up you know huge sort of um, um you know economies of scale or purchasing power whatever they've got um and you can't do much about that but you can you can make the most of what you've got um whatever kind of business that you are um, and i think that's what makes it exciting for all of us you know yeah which ultimately is also those i mean i i would also say that's kind of the basics of strategy altogether yeah is to look at what assets and what you have in your hand and how to make the best of, to get to your, well, how do you get to your goal with this, the cards that you've been dealt? Yeah. Which is like to keep the same analogy. Totally. And I think the important thing is that you are, you need to be conscious of it. And this is really the point, again, of the book is to say, if, if you just deny that luck exists and say, well, I'm just gonna, it's all about hard work and the harder I work, the luckier I get, which is a sort of well-known sort of phrase, um, then it, you, you're blinded to the various opportunities or you know, disadvantages that you have. So uh, unlike you know, for, for organizations, for clients, I feel like they should appreciate what they have been dealt. You know, what are the cards we've got? And if, they're, if there's some great cards, then they shouldn't be complacent. They should realize, well, we are lucky to have this great product or these, uh, this amazing pipeline. You know, don't get complacent about it. That's how most businesses fail, right? You know, because they don't appreciate how lucky they are. Um, and likewise, if they've been dealt a bad hand, um, they can either work out how to turn that into a good hand because there's lots of different ways that we can do that as strategists, right? Um, or they might have to accept that they are not um, as blessed as somebody else and don't try to, you know, quite often we'll work with clients and I'm sure you've been in a situation where you just almost have to say, look, you are not, you do not have the resources of these other guys. You have to accept that you've got fewer resources so play a different game than the guys with the, you know. So it's it's just yes. either way, getting people to appreciate what hand, what cards they've been dealt. I think. Yeah, and is that an analogy that you've used, or like throughout your? I mean, in the past, probably that you have to be able to convey this idea because just what you described and just communicating to a client or to someone, anybody, uh, that can be a delicate uh, conversation to say, like, well, maybe you should play a different game because you're trying to let's say beat the biggest competitor in town who's like, you know, you're a Goliath compared to you, Mr. David, and maybe you should take a different strategy. So it's sometimes a delicate conversation to be had. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, I've probably, what's been funny is that I haven't, I've maybe done it intuitively, but I've never really, um, I've never really, never really thought about luck until the, the last year. And that's, again, um, one of the things I've tried to pull out in the book is that Although there's so much of life revolves around luck, it is a bit of a taboo, especially when it comes to business. Yeah. Um, and because we don't like to talk about it, especially in the West, I mean, it's, it's different in other cultures, but in the West, we find it um, uh, awkward. And, and we, because we sort of set up this false 
dichotomy between it, it almost being the opposite of hard work. Um, you know, and if, if I if I called you lucky, you, you'd probably be insulted, wouldn't you? You'd probably think I was being really rude. Um, but I feel that luck can be a partner of hard work because sometimes you have to work really hard to make the most of your luck. So I guess what I'm saying is even, even though I've got an agency called Lucky Generals, we have not thought about luck um, since we started. We just like the name. In fact, it's a Napoleon quote. You probably know that. It's a lovely quote from Napoleon. Somebody asked him what he looked for in his officers. Um, but we didn't interrogate it. And then last year, you know, in lockdown, when I, you know, was just thinking about it, I just, I thought this is really odd that I don't know what my own company name even means. So I should probably do some research into it. Cool. A couple of things on that. Actually, I looked it up. Did you ever see that it, it's uh, a apparently misquoted from Napoleon? I mean, you might have seen that one. That uh... Well, go on, because I, I knew it was kind of pretty apocryphal. We haven't, we've never found... Um, any actual evidence that he said anything like that really no he hasn't but well so i only i didn't spend a lot of time on this one to be honest but just to replace it the uh so the quote's been turned into we need uh wait, the, wait a minute i have the page open here uh ba, 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 ba. one of the uh, aspects of that is often misquoted is give me lucky generals mm. Uh, but there's no evidence apparently that he said it. So I'm repeating something from a website, which might not be accurate either, by the way, just so, we're, just so it's said out there. Uh, however, the other quote that is probably a lot closer to what he might have said, but is probably also a quote from uh, Cardinal Mazarin, who is a politician in the 17th century, uh, because he Mazarin had said, that had noted that one not, must not ask of a general, is he skilled or is he skillful or is he good? I think is he good is one uh, way that the quote has been usually said, est-il habile? But rather, is he lucky? So I'd rather know about your general that you're telling that you're suggesting to be, whether like I'd rather have, have and get a lucky general than a really good one, which is another way that the quote is often attributed. So it's, the, it's not clear whether he, Napoleon ever said that. However, he was a big fan of Mazarin, and Mazarin did say that. Now that's, that's really interesting. Like a lot of these quotes, you um, you find out afterwards that they're, you know, it's either somebody else has said it or they didn't say it or they had a completely different um, meaning. We, I mean, we, we chose it because we, we interpreted from it. I think usually the interpretation in the UK has been, you know, bring me someone with who gets results you know, um, and, and it's not just about talking a good game, it's someone who's actually achieved it, and I don't care how, was kind of the sentiment. Um, but, you know, beyond that, we'd, when we did explore it, we, we soon found what you've discovered, that, he, you know, there's probably not very much truth behind it anyway, so uh, we just moved on. It's still a great name anyway, it works. Thank you. Out of curiosity, so you obviously you had a great career in a bunch of different ad agencies in the UK uh, and also in the States, I believe, or yeah, did Goodby, you could be in the States, right? Yeah, I went to Goodby's for a couple of years and I really enjoyed that as well. It's a lovely, a great agency in a beautiful city um, and a really good learning experience. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice thing to do, you know, obviously you've done it is to experience a different, you know, country. In a different country, culture. different culture, different environment, different mm -hmm. kinds of work. Yeah. Absolutely. But I was curious, because this is a story you might have told elsewhere, but I don't know it. So how did Lucky General start? Like, how did you move on and decide to start your own shop, I guess? Yeah, well, um, it was me and two friends, really. Um, so when I came back from Goodby's, uh, I worked with a lady called Helen Calcraft, who I, I sort of knew before from a but I'd never really worked with her, but I really, I really liked her from afar. And so I came back from America to work with her. She just set up this agency called MCBD that was doing very well. Um, and eventually I, you know, I, I, I worked for, for her at first and then I became, you know, business partner. And we had another partner called Danny came on board and it was it was the three of us running this agency called MCBD and it was doing really well, winning lots of awards and so on. Um, and we we kind of figured out, no, we should, we should do this really properly again together. Um, and so that's what we did. So it was born out of a, a friendship really which I think is a nice way to do it I mean again that's that is luck um obviously it is we must have done something to forge that connection but what you'll find and you, I'm sure you have spoken to lots of people who want to do startups but you do need a bit of luck for all the planets to align because it requires three people or however many people to all want to do it at the same time and it requires all their family 
stuff to align at the same time because that's quite difficult. And so I've spoken to a lot of people that would have wanted to do a startup but couldn't because they just didn't have the right partners. And I was lucky because here were these two partners. We'd worked together already for quite a long time. And we knew we got on well, and so we all agreed to do it. Um, and we did that seven or eight years ago. And another traditional idea, particularly for agencies, is to have a founding client. Was that something that you had as well? Or uh, not? No, no. It's, actually, it's not always the case, so. That's right. It's, we were the opposite. We sort of pretty deliberately wanted to not, I know that sounds perverse, but we, we thought we liked something of the sort of, uh, you know, let's just start from nothing. Um, in fact, actually, we uh, talking of bad historical analogies. We I can remember talking at first about this. Um, it was going to be year zero. We were going to start with the year, and then and then we discovered that that was uh, you know a really terrible phrase. I think related to Pol Pot and the Cambodian you know genocidal maniacs. So, so it's actually a really bad phrase to use for um, starting from nothing. But the idea was let's start with let's have no clients, no you know no big backers. You know we put our own money in. Um, and let's and there was a purity about it. Um, anyways, it was quite scary, but in a, mm. again, in a good way. Sometimes that um, fear you. makes you sort of uh, work harder and sort of yeah, get lucky. Well, well done. That's cool. Yeah. Super cool. No thanks. Uh, all right, let me check a couple of other things. Oh yeah, this is another thing I noted. Just uh, briefly again, I I did just browse through a couple of videos and articles and. It seemed that, and maybe, well, you, we might be able to segue quite nicely with the book on that, uh, because you're not the first person and the first strategist to to talk about this, and I am. I also talk about this at all. Is the importance of writing, and it seemed like you're in advice that you were giving on how to write a really good, well, obviously how to write a really good case study, or like how do you get an award or how do you submit it properly, and it seemed a recurring point that you were talking about the quality of writing, generally speaking. Uh, is that something that is just carried through even before or as you were studying law? Also, because you, you were talking about the fact that your teacher talked about telling a good story and he was a writer himself. Yeah. So I was wondering what place writing had in the development of either your studies or your career. And it's a bit of a yeah, broad I one. Think, but. No, I'd, I'd never, I'd, I don't know if I have really thought about this, but I, I, when you put it like that, yes, I, I feel like it is, it is storytelling and um there's a clarity that comes from writing something down, isn't there? You know, it's the classic. Um, it's why we always ask clients for a written brief. And even if they say, you yeah, don't worry, I can tell you about it. No, I actually want you to write it down because that forces you to expose the argument and you know, test it. Does it make sense? And uh, so I've always found writing things down incredibly helpful. Um, and then, you know, trying to write it in, a, in the most succinct and clear way um, I've always found different little uh, tips to do that. So law does teach you to do that because it's, it's very precise, isn't it? You need to be precise in your life. Um, but for instance, I, I found one of my great learning experiences was in the States, uh, working for Goodbees, where they didn't have um, PowerPoint or any slides at all. I don't know if that's still, this, this is a long time ago now, but um, even though this was, you know, it was the year 2000, it was the dot-com revolution and they were in San Francisco. So they were a cool, modern you know, agency, but... They had this funny thing they didn't want to, um, so they liked to tell stories. And they used to use those, what were already at that point, quite old fashioned boards, you know, that, um, you know, uh, physical boards. Uh, and of course we were always flying to pitches as well. So really you, you were limited to how many boards you could put in an art bag. And typically that's maybe six or seven boards. So what this slightly odd situation meant was that you had to condense all your strategic thinking to six or seven points uh, which I then found actually ever since a really really useful sort of discipline because you you're lucky if you've got six or seven interesting things to say you know and usually it's a beginning a middle and an end and um and so that for me has been something I've always tried to hang on to what is the simplest way to tell the story and and take things out rather than add things in um I'm, I'm not sort of unique or alone in, in saying that but it's something we all forget you know, from time to time yeah, it's always a very, very good to remind ourselves of that. And it's, I, I mean, going from the old, uh, I think this was an actual quote from Blaise Pascal, but <laughs> of like, I've, I have something I'm paraphrasing, but something along the lines of like, I'm written a long letter because I didn't have time to write a short one. Yeah, yeah it's great. Uh, which goes contradiction in contradiction to the very short and increasingly short timelines to get work done. 
in yes. our industry. Uh, so arguably, it's difficult to be able to ally both uh, being able to get things to the succinct synthesis and the best idea possible of something that's going to be very short while having a very short amount of time to get it done. And oftentimes, I don't know if you think, but oftentimes in that, in a short amount of time, the most obvious ideas and points come first. Yeah. So if you don't right. have to go time to go further, anyway, that's like an ongoing challenge. I think it is anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, I think I think that's right. It's uh, it's an ongoing, yeah, it's an ongoing challenge. Just now, and trying to use time or a lack of time to your advantage, and trying to make that into something that can get you more quickly to an interesting solution rather than just the obvious one is 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 a bit of a is one of the big skills these days. I think of good planners. Yeah, for sure. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, let me see. I think let's just move on to, was there anything? Uh, oh yeah. I noted, um, well, no, we can come back. Oh yeah. No, this is the question I wanted to ask. Sorry. I'm just like losing my own thoughts. Uh, do you have a practice or just either like a way that you take notes method practice habits, uh, of note taking, which might be either in meetings or, uh, from books that you read or articles or anything like that? Do you have any recurrent habits? Because I think that's one of the interesting ones that I'm trying to pick up on. I'm not, I'm not really well practiced in good note taking or book reviews or book summaries or things like that. So I thought I'd ask you. Yeah, um, I, I, I do sort of, um, I mean, I've got, a, I'm just looking, I've got, a, you know, scribbles and things like that beside me. I, I do take notes. I, I, I enjoy taking notes. I mean, I'm not in full form, but I, I write down words that are interesting, you know, and often words with double meanings, you know, that are, I, I love writing down analogies or metaphors that, you know, if a client has described their problem in a, in a vivid or evocative way, I feel that's often quite useful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, because those words can then sort of take on a life of their own and become, so I don't write every every single last word down, because I think listening is a really important skill as well that we forget, and and listening to the sentiment behind the words is one of the great skills that, that agencies often, you know, um, don't pay enough attention to, because sometimes people can be saying one thing, you know, as we know, and, and not actually meaning it. So um, paying attention to what is, how things and why things are being said. Um, but then I do like the specific turns of phrase that might, you know, be useful later on. Um, yeah, and put, just pulling out the, the, the main themes, um, because again, like any conversation, when we're, when we're getting a briefing from a client or when we are briefing, you know, creatives, all these important conversations we have, again, there's probably only two or three things that you, you know, that there's, there's some words that are more important than others, aren't they? What is the, what is the problem and what is what do we think the direction is and you know the what is the big watch out the thing you need to be careful about and whatever those things that might be you know you need to elevate them and you need to find a way of making sure that people have got them or that you, if you're on the receiving end that you're understanding that um there's so many occasions aren't there where we just don't quite catch the right we've might have written every single word down but we haven't picked out what the real meaning behind those words is yeah. um yeah, and this is usually something that I like to go back to the dictionary. I feel yeah. silly just to, to do that with my students because I started teaching last September right. uh, in a communications and advertising school. And I basically just show them, we go over and discuss definitions in the dictionary to begin with. Yeah. Just in case, well, it, it's useful to be able to have a common language. So, yeah. all right, great. I feel it's a great way to segue to the book. So in writing and you just taking notes and then how did that idea for the book come around and how did it get started? So you're saying it's last year, but. Yeah, last year, really. I literally never thought about writing a book. And then I suppose rather foolishly, I thought I might have some spare time last year. Can you imagine? It's sort of the, the stupidest idea ever. Um, because at the beginning of lockdown, and I don't know if other people you know, were the same, I, I obviously didn't really know how long it was going to take. I thought I was going to be sitting here, you know, looking at the window and not having a lot of work on. So I, I sort of had the core idea. Let's maybe I'll, I'll find out about luck um, because it's ridiculous. I don't know about it. Um, and and so I approached the publisher with that idea. They really liked it. Um, and by the time they'd committed and I'd committed to this idea, um, and then I realized how busy I was going to be. And it was a, a nightmare. Um it was too late, so I had to write it. But again, you know, that a, a deadline. I would never have written it otherwise. So sometimes you do need a deadline to uh, force you to do it. And 
And ultimately, again, it's been an interesting thing because it's something I've never done before. And I think sometimes, especially when you get as old as I am, you know, you need new things to sort of uh, teach you some new stuff and surprise yourself, maybe. So what's the pitch for the book? How do you describe it? So I so describe it as being um, the role of luck in building a brand okay. um, and how we can all stack the odds in our brand's favour. Um, and so you happen to suddenly thought that you're going to be stuck in the middle of the pandemic lockdown in the spring of 2020. And yeah. then a minute later, you, you have to manage your balance, your writing time with predicting to your clients exactly what the future is going to be for their category. But yeah. I'm imagining because I know that was on a lot of clients minds. And it was just like managing and listening to a lot of emergencies going on. Yeah. I don't know what kind of categories your clients work in. But for some, it might have been, I mean, for all of them, it was difficult, I guess, one way or another. All of them, including the ones, I mean, we were, again, lucky to use that word, that in that really our two biggest clients were had a, had very good years. So Amazon, um, obviously, were incredibly successful last year. But even for them, you know, that, that the amount of work that needed to be done to rip up all their plans, start again, how could they deal with the demand? So they had a different um, set of challenges. And likewise, the co-op, which is one of the biggest supermarkets in the UK, um, but also is the biggest funeral provider in the UK. Um, you know, that's a, that's a really, you know, you know, terrible problem to have, you know, because you can imagine how difficult that was. Um, and they do other things. They've got schools and, you know, um, a pharmacy business and so on. So every single bit of their business was unbelievably busy and everything was being ripped up and, and starting again. So while it was successful, it was tense and it was like, I'm sure for everybody, um, you know, it was difficult. Um, and, you know, then, of course, there are other clients that were um, busy uh, and were in more difficult times. Their markets were closing down overnight and they just ceased to exist. And, and that's a different type of challenge that none of us, of course, had ever imagined before. Um, so, yeah, it was um, it, it's certainly I'm sure every single person who's uh, you know watching this or listening to this has kind of experienced similar. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's been it's been obviously incredibly challenging. So. But not to come back on that, but you managed to complete the book and it's coming yeah. out in a few months, which is awesome. And we were chatting and exchanging uh, an email before preparing for this. And I was talking about the fact that uh, uh, I want to include more playful elements in the podcast uh, because it's one of my areas, well, my area of interest. And I think luck and randomness is a close related uh, because there's a lot of play and a lot of games that do involve randomness and luck elements. Uh, and obviously there's gambling, which comes within the Sam family, which is that is totally down to luck and randomness. And um, so we were talking and serendipity and thinking about ways to include either, you could either call them playful elements or spontaneous elements to favor creativity and ideas uh, are, are things that you are also, I think you talk about in the book as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, what I thought was like, all right, well, maybe we can play around and have a, an idea as a vehicle and show a couple of different examples and see what else comes up in the conversation. So it's yeah. not like, you know, super predictive. But the idea being at the moment, of course, well, all of the promo that you're doing is through writing, podcasts, a lot of video, which is the same as we're doing for what well, I'm doing for teaching and you're doing for work, probably. And everything's happening via not everything, but a lot of our kind of work is happening via video, very little via real events that we all miss for sure. Uh, and whether you would have had the budget or not, I thought it would be fun to have a little bit of a vehicle to talk about creative ideas. And in this case, to give ourselves a bit of a brief for the conversation, which would be if there was a, the, if we did have the ability to meet in person, you would obviously have a, a, a fantastically creative and amazing book launch event. Yeah. And uh, for us to talk about that, like what would we want in the book launch event? And how would you, and there's two things that we put together, but we can talk about others. One is uh, we have newspapers. So we said we were both going to buy that. And mm -hmm. we, I think you said that came from a musician. Was that right? Yeah, I think uh, David newspapers? Bowie um, uh, used to cut up newspapers and throw them up in the air. And then when the words landed, they would make random combinations that had never been seen before. So it made for really interesting lyrics. And so a lot of his songs at least started off and then he would sometimes go back over them and change them, but they started off as a uh, cut up newspaper. So, so I, I quite like that as a little technique. 
So and so we have I haven't got into I don't think you have got into cutting down the newspaper itself. No, but we have, both have yeah, that newspaper. examples of the newspaper. We'll pick up a random page and or word. We can either throw a couple of dice to decide or just like pick whatever image we open up the, the, uh, the newspaper and get started on what that inspires us for the book launch event. And then I also prepared a this is something that more that comes from tabletop role playing games that I sometimes include in briefing material, um, which is a, a generator of randomized tables. And okay. so I've used this in, uh, in briefing with and working with uh, brainstorming and ideation sessions, which is, uh, so you don't necessarily, there's a, actually, let's do this afterwards. We'll talk about the newspaper first. Should cool. we do that? Yeah, let's have a try. Okay, okay. great. Uh, do you want to go first or should I go? You go first, you go first. Right, I'll go first. I will open at a random, maybe not this page, because this is just literally market data. <laughs> okay. I have an article about a solid case for next generation batteries. And 12th, I'm just literally, this is where my eyes went. Um, it's just talking about batteries and the, the entry level Tesla Model 3, for instance, starts at 37, 19 99 Okay. How about Tesla and Tesla's for then? How would Tesla feature in your launch event? Yeah, that's cool. Well, we can sort of talk about Tesla. I think um, or batteries and electricity, or, batteries, or maybe even I quite like the phrase "young generation." So that for me, that's kind of a that's the sort of word I would write down when I was uh, what I meant by taking notes. In that context, it means um, I guess it means uh, you know the 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 new generation of products, but. But I would have written down the words young generation there. And then that might have made me think children is kind of interesting because I think children are lucky because they they don't have a lot of the inhibitions um, that we do. They don't play by the same rules, do they? They, um, they don't real, realize that, you know, things like cost, you know, of, of things. So, so actually getting, there's a lot of interesting campaigns, some of which I talk about in the book about where if you ask a child to define the challenge or the problem, they come up with something really interesting because they've got a naive perspective that we've all trained out of ourselves. So, so maybe the launch event could have um, some amazing, you know, lucky children um, uh, who could, uh, you know, uh, could provide some unusual and sort of fun points of view on some of the problems that are facing the world. It'd be interesting to see what what did they what would some kids say about Tesla. Um, for instance, what would kids say about Tesla? I think they like that. That's cool. It's an interesting one on what you're talking about with children. They, um, the, I used to work in personal development and coaching. Hmm. And one of the analogies that's used in this kind of, or at least the course I did, but I think they're not the only ones to use it is, of course, a child starts with, uh, they don't know what's possible or not possible. This is something that you learn as an adult. Hmm. Part of the reason it's the expression of exactly what you were just saying. So the, the idea is that we start out with a full blown complete set of everything is possible because you don't know what's not. Mm. And then with every decision you make about yourself, you close off a lot of different, you close off some little bit of life. Yeah. Little by little, we wall ourselves in. Mm. So for example, you know, we talk and we look back at decisions that you made in your life. For example, if you're 13 at the first school dance, and you know somebody chuckles and you decide i'm not a good dancer and that's like all right you know i'm never going to dance when i go to a party and that's some that's just li mm -hmm. a little bit of life that you cut off as a as something that you don't realize that you don't really have as something that's possible anymore mm -hmm. and as you said I, I totally agree that children are the the view for this cool do, do you know but, uh, there's a great there's a lovely quote i think i can't remember the exact words but einstein used to always talk about um the secret the secret to creativity is to think like a child yeah. um and then I think some a university has quantified that. They, they wanted to see whether that was true. And they asked two groups of people to do some creative problem solving. And they, they deliberately asked the first group to imagine that they were seven-year-old children. And they came up with, with much better answers because they'd you know, just been instructed to do that. And I suppose what they took out of that is this is, okay, we've lost that childish nature because we're all adults. But if we can, again, mindfully, consciously think of it, then that is a way that you can perhaps stack the odds in your favor because you're deliberately trying to think in a different way. So maybe, yeah. Yeah, maybe do that. 
Yeah, and that's usually it talks back to what I talk about when I talk about going, trying to enter or favor a playful state of mind, which is also the mind of a child. Uh, mm-hmm. And in Zen, they talk also that there's a, a beginner's mind, Zen mind, beginner's mind is a classic of, of Zen thinking, and they talk about it as a beginner's mind. Yeah, because it's the same as the child as you start with a blank slate and you start with somebody like I don't know anything about this area and starting with I don't know is a lot richer than thinking yeah. that you're the person who knows, even Definitely. though it might go against the grain as we, we were talking about earlier of a modern business environment where it's not particularly it's not necessarily celebrated to be and to say out loud that I actually don't know the answer to the question right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, exactly. Should I have a little look at see what yeah, else? Sure. Time. Um, I'm okay. I've got so I've opened it straight up as um, let me quick one. Polar bears oh, fail, <laughs> fail to crack egg hunting in the Arctic. I've no fail idea to crack down on egg hunting in the Arctic. Yeah, I, I. It seems like I'm going to have to read that story afterwards. I don't know what it's. It's a, it, it's a, it's a good uh, clickbait. <laughs> yeah. Even though it's been written down on they've paper. Not, they've not proved clever at sniffing out new foods, apparently. So it's, I, I think, um, after after locating its quarry by smell, the polar bear will wait patiently beside the seal's breathing hole in the sea ice, and then when its prey finally breaks the surface, the bear strikes. But as the Arctic becomes warmer, this ritual is becoming uh, rarer. So I guess maybe it's about, um, you know, it's one of these stories about the global warming and how, uh, about how, how, how creatures deal with change. So maybe that's, maybe that's a theme that we would, uh, could, you know, that we could play with. How do we, you know. How do we include something to do with, uh, so two things. I was thinking on one hand, I thought of, uh, well, ice cream for everyone and the ice cream for everyone podcast. Oh, yeah, exactly. Arctic ice, polar bear, and climate change. If it would be super cool to have a, a, a plus, it goes along with a child kind of childlike theme of a, a uh, an extravagant, uh, or I don't know if it's extravagant, but an ice cream bar. Anyway, yeah, an ice cream bar uh, with possibly just like raising funds to, for climate change. So there's an opportunity while the ice creams and ice cream creations are given, uh, there's all sorts, there's a colorful background that shows some of the struggles of, uh, the Arctic animals, such as the seal and the white bear or the polar bear. And there's an opportunity to, you know, donate money for a specific cause, which I guess, I, oh, by the way, that reminds me, um, that reminds me there's an important point on raising money for a cause for the for the book that you're launching as well actually which is a little bit of a non sequitur but i thought it's a, like it's important yeah. for us not to yeah that. well actually well maybe, maybe the, so the point there is that uh, all the royalties are going to um a, an organization called commercial break which helps working class kids get a lucky break into the our industry so actually maybe we could you know be inspired by the polar bear to, um, you know, if, if that article, if I if I'm reading it right, I've not read it, is about the, um, uh, you know, the, these animals having evolved to keep up with different, you know, aspects of global warming and so on. Well, I guess maybe we're all, you know, that's what we're all having to do is adapt to whether it's global warming or the pandemic or or in this case, you know, this. You know that some of the challenges that we've all been examining about diversity. Well, one the thing that we, you know, one of the things that we've been worried about is class, and you know um, how how difficult it is if you're working class, and and that actually, you know, intersects with other things like race and ethnicity and so on. And so, um, yeah, maybe there's a maybe one of the themes of our launch event could be like the polar bear. We have to try and uh, find new ways of uh, dealing with these things. We, you know, um, and the book is one of them, I guess. Um, Great. Hmm. Perfect. And the other thing I, I kind of tacked onto the uh, the seal's breathing hole, uh, which I thought oh, was yeah. interesting. Um, and uh, I don't know what to do with this as the feature for the event, but I kind of thought it was interesting. And on a side note, I don't know if you saw this, just because I came across it, but you might have come across it. Not that it's an amazing advertising thing, but it's uh, interesting that uh, the last few months have been the So 2021 is celebrating the 50th anniversary of Cadbury's cream egg. And it was just the Easter weekend past weekend. And they did a campaign that was a little bit of a Charlie and the chocolate factory golden ticket 
So they had golden eggs that were spread out. Uh, well, anyway, the Easter egg hunt just made me think of that. So, yeah, but I don't think that really fits with the. Um, no, the other thing about the seal thing again, I don't uh-huh. not knowing the stories. It sounds like the polar bear is sort of cooperating or is in a relationship with the seal. You know, as animals often do, aren't they? You know, there's a sort of a symbiosis. Yes. Yeah. And um, and actually, one of the ways that we're all going to have to deal with climate change is by cooperation, I think. And so mm-hmm. one of the things we talk about in the book is, you know, some of these big things that are going on in the world can only be solved if we work together. And so, um, you know, part of part of luck in future is going to be not um, not keeping our luck to ourselves. It's going it's going to be if we've got a great idea, it's, it's sharing it with other people to solve bigger problems and to make more for everybody. So and I think that's one of the mistakes about luck. People people think that if they've been lucky, sometimes they, they need to keep it to themselves and, you know, they've earned it. Whereas, whereas actually luck gets bigger a lot of the time if you share it out. So, um, yeah, I, I guess what, what hopefully all these things do is just show that a random element like a newspaper there, yeah. you know, um, it just generates different ideas, doesn't it? Exactly. Might have thought of, it does, and I think for specifically for anybody who is a strategist, planner, uh, I use those words interchangeably, to be honest, uh, we, well, because it's not the forum to talk about the specificities. Yeah, don't them. worry, I, I always use them both the same. I'm not a big... You know. uh, but also anybody who organizes meetings like ideation, brainstorming meetings, or anything like that, I think there's a tendency to either think that you should come in with the right answer and that the people that you're first strategist or planner that like I have the right answer and I'm going to guide everybody towards the right direction. Uh, but I, just like when you were talking about listening, I think with more experience and more well, more well, more listening. To be honest, I came in with more. I've tended to change in a way that was like actually, I really I don't know the answer. I do have a lot of different elements that are hopefully going to get us there. But I also want to have a lot more listening to the input from a lot of all the other participants, whether like from the client to the creative, to the account managers, to anybody who is involved in whatsoever in the process. Mm -hmm. Uh, And rather than being arrogant and thinking that I have the right answer, regardless of everybody's input. And uh, and then the other side, which is to think that it's easy to have everybody's idea for every. And this is actually a good segue to the next part of the thing that we're going to go through. Uh, it's easy to have an idea and it's just like okay here's the directing line for a meeting what are your ideas yeah but actually starting from a blank slate can be really difficult so even though this is a random input it gets the conversation started yeah Uh, and it, it can be often even a random input can be more valuable than just asking people to go from blank slate nothing just give me your best ideas about this thing Definitely. Now, if you ask any creative person, the, the worst thing is to have a blank sheet of paper. I mean, it's, they need something to go with. It's terrible otherwise. And, and as you say, even if it's, even if it's not ultimately the, you know, the answer, it helps you get the conversation started. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and another way to do that is these randomized tables that I talked yeah. about. And yeah. uh, I'll share my screen. If you're watching this, you will see that if you're listening to this, I will put it in the show notes, but it doesn't really matter. We will talk through what is in the charts and the rest of it. You're not missing all that much, to be honest. Uh, all right, let me show you the screen. Looking forward to this. This, this seems uh, crazy in a good way. I like, I like <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, wait, uh, just opening the file. Okay, here. So in tabletop role-playing games, a recurring uh, way to decide what's going to happen next, essentially, is to have these like these types of tables. Uh, right. And I, I actually participate in a theory of tabletop role-playing game podcast where we talked about the value of these kinds of tables And in this case, I said, well, let's create a book launch event generator. And you can either, and I have six boxes just to describe it for anybody listening. And I made this completely randomly. Uh, But if you are talking in a, or if you're preparing a brainstorm, you can do this with a lot more intention. Let's say if you were working on a client, you could specifically have tables that would be relating to trends that are going on in your 
uh, in the category of your client. You can go talk about uh, news. You could talk about if we were to, you know, to take on the book launch event. So I have six boxes uh, because I we can use dice and we can either throw a six sided die, a traditional six sided die to decide what's going to happen, or you can choose based on your inspiration. So I have one for locations. Uh, two is venue, three is the style of the event, four is the type of catering, five is the guest star of the event, and six is a wild card that are just wildly amazing or bad things that could be happening during the event to make it a story. What's the story of the event? And um, so we can, and, and each one of those has six different locations. So ideally, well, it, it, technically, if you're using the random method, you would throw one dice to decide which of those five, uh, six sections, and then another die to decide exactly what's going to, like, who's going to be the guest star, or what's the style of the event. But equally, it's equally valid to just use this as, you know, the beginning input and whatever inspires the conversation, just like we did with the newspaper. Except that the, the difference between with the newspaper and this is, I mean, even though this was done a little bit randomly and it's a bit of the fun of the book launch event, but if I was preparing for a brainstorm, I could be a lot more deliberate in what I was choosing to put there, right? Uh, I mean, I was deliberate, but um, so all that said, what should we do for the book launch event? Do you want to throw a dice uh, or die? Die or dice? <laughs> I, don't I think know. you can use either. I've never really known which one to say there. Why don't you roll a dice? I, I, I was struggling to find one today. Okay, I will roll a dice. I rolled a three, and that is three is style. And under style, we have six options that are posh. It's the style of the book launch event. Yeah. Uh, where we do have an ice cream bar. We talk about uh, a global awareness, uh, electricity. There's going to be a lot of young people, childlike atmosphere. But also, uh, it could be posh, shabby chic, hipsterish, madmen, punk rock, or Instagram generation, whatever that means. I don't know. I just literally put that down. I sometimes don't know exactly. I also did this a little bit quickly. I have to admit, I don't have a lot of time to put into it. Uh, and is there something that inspires you of those six, or should I throw another dice? I just think throw it, throw it, the dice. Let the right. dice tell us. Dice tell us. Uh, well, the dice says three again, so we have a hipsterish event. Hipsterish. Wow. Okay. So the style is hipsterish. Okay, and let's do another one. I'll change that. Two, and the venue is going to be, I keep throwing threes. Yes. <laughs> Why? Uh, it's a prohibition speakeasy bar. Right. As well with the hipsterish. Yeah. And you can mix and match. We can either take something from the newspaper and add some more of this, or um, or we could keep going let's, uh, or let's just talk another, through this a little bit. Should we add another couple of elements in? Let's should do we, it. Let's do that. And then, and then do you I'm want gonna... to add a wild card? Yeah, let's have a wild card. Someone important faints during the event. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> I, by the way, I don't know why this matters, but uh, I thought it would be kind of fun because usually big events have breakdowns or breakthroughs or both. They're yeah. like for anybody working in events, there's a lot of things that go completely terribly wrong, but that you can recover from. This goes yeah. back to your idea of like, what do you do with the cards that you dealt? Yeah. So I, I think that could be really helpful. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if we if we just work with sure, those let's. three elements, but yeah. Uh, that one's like a really easy one to do because a big part of the book and a big part of luck is about how do you respond to bad luck and turn that into something that is good luck. So so actually we could have staged it almost for, you know, we could have arranged in advance for someone to faint um, because that's a pretty cool way of maybe dramatizing my point. Maybe this person faints and that creates a lot of uh, drama in the room and social media, um, but then they actually get up and, um, they're able to talk about the the importance of being able to pick yourself back up and um, you know recover from bad luck could be quite a dramatic way to make that um, point. So I, I I love I love that that I must think about that if I ever do a, if if we ever go back into the real world and we can do a physical launch event. Yes. Um, so that's that's Perfect. good. 
Excellent. Um, All right, great. That's at least it generated some kind of idea. So it's good to have a little bit of fun with those. The rest were quite factual. I mean, it depends what it depends what what ideas are sparked or not. Sometimes you don't really know in advance. Um, and prohibition speakeasies is that would that be your drink of choice or not particularly or like the types of drinks you enjoy? Yeah. That could be ambience, nice. I guess. Yeah, it could be nice. Could it be cocktails? I feel like that would give the launch event a nice sort of almost like a well kept secret event. Because I think the nice thing about those prohibition bars is um the in on the inside it's everything's wild, you know, everything's having a great time and you know, really uninhibited. Um uh, but maybe on the outside world you don't know what's happening. And I think there's you know, so we could we could maybe build that into the theming of you know, the great, the, here's the secrets about how to, mm. you know, build your, build some luck into your brand and, and make it very clandestine. And, you know, I think that, that could play pretty well, couldn't it? That um, reminds me when I went to, I only went to uh, South by Southwest uh, Interactive once, 2009. So it was a long time ago, but I went to one session about secrets in marketing, how to use secrets in marketing campaigns. And it was a, a really fun and interesting event to look okay. at uh and there were a bunch of stories shared and for example one of them was uh a uh, there's a lucky seven there's a secret menu so secret menus have been a thing that's been that have been used by a few different brands mm -hmm. and one of them is the if i remember correctly the lucky seven casino and it's uh, in las vegas and it's an off strip place so uh, a lot of people don't go anymore it's a little old school uh and one of the ways that they cheaply managed to get known or have still more people i don't know if this is still true by the way this is something that i heard back then mm -hmm. uh, is that the the lucky seven casino and the bar of their restaurant has a secret item on the menu which is a a full big steak for seven dollars and 77 cents which mm -hmm. is uh, you know seven is a lucky number yeah. And you have yeah. to order the seven, the lucky seven meal that is not on the menu. And then you get a steak dinner for $7 and 77 cents, which is obviously That's to perfect. attract people. And there's no, no advertising. It's only word of mouth of the people that are in the know, et cetera, which is kind of fun. Yeah. I love things like that, little Easter eggs. And, I, and actually one of the things I've put in the book is I've, cause I like things like mistakes as well. Yeah. You know, a mistake can be lucky. So I've made a deliberate mistake in the book um, and I've hidden it in, in there and the first person to find it and email me on, um, I think it's lucky mistakes at, you know, luckygenerals.com um, wins, you know, 250 pounds or something like that. Um, and so I think putting those playful mistakes or secrets, you know, hiding, uh, I like, we all like hiding things, don't we? Because again, it's that childish sort of um, aspect of knowing we know where something is that other people don't know about. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we build in the secrecy uh, into this launch idea. And then what about hipster hipsterish? That's um, I guess maybe harder, is it? Um, it is a little bit harder, only because it's just so. Uh, well, they do. So okay. So here's the thing. So they do. It's. A, I don't even know if this is still current or not because we've not had a, a lot of people haven't had access to haircuts <laughs> for a while, <laughs> but. Um, the hipsters tend to have, even though it's, this is completely about even just calling hipsters is very stereotypical in the first place, but they do tend to be trend hunters. Yeah. They learn, they're in advance. They do have good tastes. I mean, it seems a little bit to me sometimes completely arrogant about it, but they have, uh, you know, good coffee, good food, good stuff, uh, Taylor. So actually one fun thing that was around making fun of hipsters was these vid. Do you remember there's a couple of videos uh, and one of them in particular, I'm thinking there was a mock video of, of documentaries of artisanal and craft hipsterish stuff. Oh, right. Okay. There's That's one funny. person that makes artisanal craft firewood, and it's a docu <laughs> it's a short documentary about this person who has a very well kept beard and you know uh, checkered close knit mm. well close checkered shirt, and they make art artisanal firewood. Fantastic! I love it. Uh, and it's it's quite funny. So I was so maybe you could have a an attendant that is carving specifically nicely done uh, artisanal firewood to, to feed into the fireplace. And of course you would have a very hipsterish cocktail uh, expert. Oh, they're called mixologists, sorry, not a cocktail expert. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, who can talk about the history of all the different cocktails. And I don't know, what would be a luck? Is there a luck? I don't know if you how much you study this, but there must be ingredients that are associated with luck because there's all sorts of like old 
wives or grandma's tales. Uh, and I wonder if that could be the special cocktail of a, an ingredient associated with luck. Yeah, that would be interesting. I don't I'm... know what kind of herb is associated with luck. Yeah, um, there's lots of animals associated with luck, aren't there? Yeah. Um, well, certainly, well, the rabbit's paw and the... Um... I, th I think pig, in Germany, it's um, pig, I think, the schwein is a... Um, oh, is it? Is, a, is, a, is very much a symbol of, of luck. Um, I think cows in some cultures, you know, so there's a few different uh, animals. Um, so I'm just opening a website uh, because I'm just doing a quick search of best 11 herbs for good luck, success, prosperity, and abundance. So we have Irish moss, which I don't know how that would go to cocktail, poppy mm -hmm. seeds, cinnamon, cinnamon. Cinnamon sounds good. Cinnamon sounds good. We can totally have, or citronella. So cinnamon sounds good. So, like, so there could be if yeah. apparently something associated with luck and the hipsterish would be the mixologist that went yeah. to look for the right ingredients associated yeah. with luck to create the night's special cocktail for the book launch event. The <laughs> cinnamon would feature in it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. It sounds like a great event. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool, perfect. I think I, I really appreciate it. This was fun. Yeah. Um, and it gives uh, hopefully a little bit of an idea of people of just, you know, different tools that you can use. And I imagine a lot of other examples will be in the book when it's launched as well, right? Yeah, that, that's right. I think it's, it's applying that sort of playfulness, you know, and then of course, what we would do, you know, we've generated, you know, just that from that little chat there, we've generated a couple of three ideas, but if we kept on talking about this, and if we were really serious about putting this event on, we'd, we'd interrogate them and we would apply some more rigor and we'd go back and add new ones and so on. But again, it's about starting, but also making the process just more fun. And sometimes your know, strategy can be hard work, can't it? And it can be yeah. daunting because we feel, oh, we've got to crack it and the idea has got to be perfect. But I think what that exercise shows is that you can have more fun and enjoyment um, in the process and probably get to more unusual, you know, answers. Like we would, I would never on my own have gone to a prohibition theme with hipsters where someone faints. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Um, <laughs> exactly. But that actually sounds like it could be quite an interesting sort of uh, thing to attend rather than just some boring old um, sort of book launch that we've done through a linear process. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Cool. I usually finish the interviews with a couple of um, cool down questions. We have a couple more yeah. minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let me ask you, well, first, um, I don't know if you like ice cream or if you have a favorite flavor that, uh, that's a traditional for the podcast. Uh, that's that's hilarious. I'm I'm famous in my family for being really really loving ice cream. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, uh, so in any flavor basically, but um, yeah, strawberry in particular is uh, yeah. It's, it's and do you prefer strawberry drop. ice cream or strawberry sorbet? Uh, very much ice cream. I'm not a sorbet fan. No. Um, okay. Cool. Uh, all right, here's another question. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da. I know, so I don't know how much you're into games, but you said you're into sports. Uh, is there a game that you particularly enjoy and recommend either playing or practicing if there's anything on that side of things? Uh, so what, like gaming? Uh, it can either be a game uh, or if you have played any kind of board game, card game, or something that you might have enjoyed in the past, or it could simply be a sport because you actually prefer that kind of thing. Uh, I, you know, I prefer um, probably physical um, sport. Not that I'm exactly, you know, in my peak athletic condition right now. Uh, definitely but, not. Not that I was before, but I'm even worse a year of pandemic and lockdowns later. Um, it's not good. I'm, I'm terrible right now, but um, I, I love football for its, um, just its simplicity. It is the beautiful game. I think there's a lot of wrong things that are wrong with the sport at the moment, you know, the people who run it, but at its best it's still it's universal isn't it we all it's a common language that the whole world can talk about and be excited by so yeah uh, i'm not I, i've never been a big one on football but my my brother is and i was with him for easter weekend so we went to play out on the on the pitch next to his village which was really nice actually to well actually down to the pandemic and body shape condition realizing that i really need to exercise my body needs a little bit <laughs> Not for anything to do of whether I'm good or not or football. It was nice to play around with a ball, yeah. but uh, yeah. but yeah, I need to, to do some exercise a little bit. Yeah. Cool. Uh, last one, a um, the last piece of art or media that really had an impact on you that you would recommend to others. It could be anything, like could be a TV show, a book, or a piece of art, a painting, whatever. Uh, oh well, okay. Well, um, God, this is my, where my mind goes a blank. I'm sure there's lots of. Uh, 
feel like I've seen lots of cool films and I've watched the whole of Netflix uh, recently. But um, a lot of people have that impression. What if I just because we're talking about games there? What was the what was the um, the Netflix series about the uh, the, um, the Queen's Gambit? Yeah, Queen's Gambit. There you go. Absolutely love that because that was it's a good one. such an amazing true story and. Uh, I mean, again, it's a great lesson for all of us. How do you take something which stereotypically is not interesting? Uh, and, you know, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'd love to have seen that pitch to Netflix. You know, we're going to make a whole series about chess. I mean, it sounds utterly boring, but they made it magnificent and interesting, didn't they? Yeah. Um, In a similar so, vein, have you seen, uh, it's very Disney, but it's it's well done and it's a lot of fun and uplifting for that. The C Queen of Katwe. Oh, is it about a Ugandan? Um, a Ugandan chess player? Uh, my mum, of all people, uh, was telling me that it is, she is evangelical about how wonderful that um, it's is. It's a great movie. Watch yeah. It. It's yeah. very Disney-ish. Of course, it's very to it's told in a very Disney-ish. But yeah. the actors are fantastic. The story yeah. is great. Uh, yeah. it's, it's uplifting. It's a true story again, isn't it? Huh? Um, it's a true story again, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Based on a true story of uh, somebody who was living in the Ugandan city slums and manages like to randomly find this a uh, chess club and is a genius at chess mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. goes and travels internationally and first of course there's like the class thing they have like the kids from the streets that are coached by this teacher who wants to kind of like give them an opportunity to um to do other things and uh, they have to go and play against the rich kids of the the city in uganda and you know it's quite traditional in the way that it's done together as a story but mm -hmm. it's exactly the kind of challenge like challenger person that is lift out of nowhere and has an amazing gift that is cultivated by the people around her with a little bit of drama and things in between but it's a it's a really great one so yeah queen's gambit and queen of katwe are it's another one that i recommend checking out yeah. cool Fantastic. andy thank you so much for taking time to have this conversation let's make sure that we know uh, where people can find you where they can pre-order the book uh and whatever information so they can pre-order the book on where should they go yeah, they can get it from all the usual places or Amazon being the obvious one. Um, yeah. It's in, on Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk. So the go Amazon. look yourself on Amazon.co.uk, which of course is a fun title, by the way. I yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's nice about it is that Amazon will ask you, did you mean, and they'll ask you, <laughs> did you mean go fuck yourself, which is sort of surreal and enjoyable in its own right. Uh, so yeah, and then all the other usual places in your market, whether it's Barnes & Noble or Waterstones or, you know, it's in, in those secondary players as well. Great. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And thank you very much. All right. Another episode wrapped up. Uh, quick outro. Don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, comment and review the podcast for any upcoming episodes. I'm planning a few more episodes of, well, not just a few, but a bunch more episodes of exciting stuff. I'm always up to talk to new people. So if you have an idea, if you'd like to talk to me, if you'd like to play a game or some kind of playful activity that would be part of the interview and uh, or part of the conversation then i'd love to have you and uh, i'll talk to you soon good morning afternoon night whatever time of day and night it is for you bye